Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we dive into poverty and its alleviation. In the second half of our show, we'll be speaking with Maget Wade, a Senegalese serial entrepreneur. Up first is Michael Matheson Miller, a research fellow at the Acton Institute and the producer and director of an award-winning documentary called Poverty, Inc. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. Michael, you've done a lot of international field work. You were the chairman of the philosophy and theology department in Nicaragua, so you've also been a teacher. You're now at the Acton Institute overseeing their program in international work. Tell us a little bit about how your background has informed your your views. Well, I mean, I think especially in the related to this poverty question, I've had the great opportunity to live abroad, see a lot of different things, Mm. and also to study philosophy, and the two of them kind of came together. I think one of the things that struck me as I studied philosophy was the subjective nature of the person. I don't mean that there's no truth and it's subjectivity or subjectivism Mm. or anything. What I mean is that the human being is a subject, not simply an object. And when you take this idea of the subjective nature of the person and you apply that to thinking about economics or poverty and these questions, I think it helps change and reframe the way we look at problems. Give us an example. Well, so for example, you know, we tend to look at poor people and, you know, we see poverty in the world, right? And we say, you know, what can I do to help? How am I going to help out? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we come up with big solutions. And I mean, these come from good hearts. You know, we're going to send over shoes or big transactions of international foreign aid or whatever it might be. But oftentimes we end up making people the objects of our charity, instead of the subjects and protagonists Hmm. of their own story of development. Does it make us feel better to make them objects? Well, I don't think we intend to make them objects, right? I think this is precisely the problem. We we don't even think about it. It's a subconscious thing. We are treating people as the objects of our charity because we want to feel good and we want to help them instead of asking, like, how would I want to be treated, right? Hmm. And so we end up asking wrong questions. So, for example, we say, okay, what can I do to alleviate poverty? What can I do to help? Well, a better question is, how do people in poverty create prosperity for their families and communities? So, Michael, your approach is informed by your Catholicism. A little while ago, Pope Francis wrote an exhortation. I think it was called Evangelii Gaudium. It generated a lot of excitement on the left and, in fact, a fair amount of consternation among free marketers. How How do you view it? Well, I mean, I think both the left and the right probably overreacted. I mean, first of all, the Pope was not writing an economic document. You know, even he said, you know, I'm not an economist. And basically, like, you know, I don't want to get overly technical, Mm -hmm. but in the big picture, Catholic social teaching, and and this is probably part of it, is not a policy prescription. And the the Church is very clear. It It is an orientation. It is a way of thinking. And it actually goes back to that question of the subjective nature of the person. Like, how do we under, how do we think about persons, the common good, the importance of solidarity, but also the importance of subsidiarity, which is a big word, basically means those closest to the problem should handle it. So I think, you know, I think people are, are probably a little bit overreacting on both sides. You know, I wrote about this, and I think that, first of all, it's a mistake to see the Pope simply through a political lens or an economic lens. He wasn't saying, you know, we need these policies. Mm-hmm. The name Evangelii Evangeli Gaudium is the joy of the gospel, and he was challenging Christians to integrate the gospel in every part of their lives, including economics. Now, do I think that the Pope's words on economics lacked precision? Yes, I mean, I think they do. But at the same time, you know, he said some things that they're important. I think free exchange is very important because when an economy becomes highly regulated, it's often big business and big powerful interest groups that take over, mm-hmm. and the poorest of the poor lack the political, the social, and the economic context to, to be able to navigate the system. So I think like on the Pope, he said a couple things that are imp- important. He said, you know, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized. And, and I agree. I think he's right. He said, sometimes, you know, we're more concerned with the stock market or the new thing that we're going to buy instead mm-hmm. of the fate of a poor person. And I think that that's right. He also did not say the free market can't create economic growth. He just said it's a mistake to think that economic growth alone right, will solves everybody's justice problem. justice and inclusiveness. So what happened is people on the left are saying, you yeah. know, see, the free market is terrible, and the Pope agrees, and all Catholics should believe in that. And then people on the right are like, oh, the Pope, you know, he's criticizing the free market. Now, look, I don't want to spin the Pope. I do not think he is very friendly 
to market. Mm. I think he's skeptical. And as I've written, I think that's unfortunate because a competitive economy with free exchange actually offers the greatest chance for inclusion for the poor. And this is what the Pope desires. And I mean, if you look through story after story, example after example, poor people are not dominated by markets. Poor people are excluded from them. So, Michael, take us to La Cava and Buenos Aires. What did you see there and what did you learn there? Well, I had a chance to go visit this area, which is a very poor area on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. And I was in there with a, a pastor and a local city councilman. And it's a very interesting place, Bill, because there's almost like an unofficial line around mm -hmm. this big neighborhood where the police drive around. And inside, really, there's no rule of law. They don't there's go. no clear private property. Mm. There's no taxes. And so you have all these people who are basically locked out of markets, locked out of networks of productivity. And so it, there was some crime in, in the city. And so instead of the police going in and trying to kind of help out, they actually started to drive around the border. The police won't even go inside. No but we were able zone. to go in and we were able to talk to people. And what you find is these are hardworking people. What they lack are the institutions of justice. They are locked out from market. So it's not free stuff that's going to solve their problem. No, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things you hear, and we talked about, you know, religion before. One of the things a lot of Christians will say, you know, if North American Christians were more generous, we could just raise $84 billion and we could end extreme poverty. Well, no, because poor people are not poor because they lack stuff. Poor people are poor because they lack the institutions of justice that enable them to create prosperity for their families and communities. So I was in Kenya, for example. I met a man named Joshua Omoga, and he lives in Kibera, which is really a large mm -hmm. slum right in Nairobi. He moved there from a rural area looking to find work. It took him several years, and he couldn't find a job. So he ended up borrowing about $8 from friends, and he started a little tiny shop. And he works every day from about 5 in the morning till 10 at night selling and he's grown his mm -hmm. business a little bit. Problem is, he lives in a place where there's no clear title. You can't right. own the land. He can't register his business. Now, these things sound boring, right? Like title and registering a business. But without clear title and without registering his business, he can't grow his shop. Right, can't raise money. He can't get protection from the courts. He lacks justice in the courts. If somebody takes his property, what's he going to do? Mm. And so what happens is you have millions of poor people who are extremely entrepreneurial. They're just like us. They're just like people in Silicon Valley. They're not somehow radically different from us, mm -hmm. right? What they lack are these institutions of justice, things like clear title to their land, access to justice in the courts, the ability to have free exchange and participate in economies, not be locked out by massive tariffs or governments mm -hmm. setting prices. So this is really the problem. And it goes back to that subjective thing, right? If you think of how would we operate, right? How would we think about ourselves in a poor place? Would we want somebody to give us something? Or would we want the opportunity to be able to create prosperity or create opportunities for our families? One guy I talked to um, in Haiti, Daniel Jean-Louis is his name, does a lot of work helping businesses start up. He said very powerfully, no one wants to be a beggar for life, right? No one in Haiti mm -hmm. wants to be a beggar for life. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of things that we do to so-called help the poor actually hurt the poor. So let's give an example. We give free food away or we subsidize our agriculture and we sell it very cheaply with low tariffs. So let's hear what happens. So in Europe and the United States, we subsidize our agriculture, mm -hmm. we overproduce, and then we take the, take the extra food and we either give it as aid or sell it very cheaply into markets like Haiti or other places. And it feels like we're helping. Oh, yeah. I mean, it feels like we're doing a great thing. Okay. Well, there's two things that happen. One is we end up destroying local farmers. Mm -hmm. okay? We put them, put out, them of out of business. Because how are they going to compete if they're buying free against free stuff, right? Number two, then we delay the development of business mm -hmm. in the developing world. Because if you're, again, if you're giving away free things, then it's hard for people to compete. And this is not just foreign aid. It's also a private charity, right? But the other thing that happens especially with, with foreign aid, is the rise of crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. So the Guardian newspaper reported that out of a billion dollars in, in, for, in foreign food aid, 70%, okay, that's $700 million, 70% mm -hmm. of a billion dollars went to three companies. Yeah. All right, that means that sometimes you have the right and the left fighting about this. I mean, let's come together. I mean, our tax dollars are not simply going to help 
people in the developing world. They're coming back. Yeah, they're going into pockets right here. Yeah, they're subsidizing massive corporations. So, Michael, describe, if you would, the global poverty industry. How big is it? How long has it been in operation? And, and what's its track record? The poverty industry really began at the end of World War II. You had this idea that, you know, we've won the war, let's win the peace. Mm-hmm. And we've planned the war, now let's plan development. And mm-hmm. so there's this idea that if you sent over large amounts of money and foreign aid, you could jumpstart economies and move them into industrialism. So the intentions were very good. And I think some numbers say we've sent over $2 trillion in foreign aid. Well, it worked in Europe. The Marshall Plan worked in Europe, but somehow hasn't worked in Africa. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of debate on the Marshall Plan that we don't need to get into. Okay. But the difference is the Marshall Plan was a very small element of European economy that you were dealing with already industrialized mm, nations. Right. In Africa and Latin America, but especially in Africa, it became a huge part. And so what it ended up doing, this goes to your question, what it ended up doing is it ended up politicizing development. So instead of development becoming economic, it was who got their hands on the aid. Yeah. And so the late economist Peter Bauer said that foreign aid created the third world. It actually created a whole different model of development that became mm. highly politicized. So as I said, we've got two, probably two, over two trillion dollars over the, over the last you know, 50 to 60 years. And the problem with it is that it ends up doing things that weren't intended. Give us an example. One of the things it does is we can end up subsidizing dictators, mm. right? So, so when foreign aid is given, if the dictator's getting money, he doesn't need to build, build a tax an base. economy. Right. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't need to build a tax base because now what happens is it cuts the link between the leader of his nation and the people. It's like oil. Instead, exactly. So instead, he's dealing with consultants and other people outside the country. So it ends up subsidizing dictators, subsidizing corruption. It also means that if you're going to get where the money is, then you need to go into politics. So civil service and politics, instead of business, instead of entrepreneurship, the most lucrative business. Yeah. That's what happens. The other thing is it transfers the decision-making away from, say, African countries and puts it in you know, Washington, D.C., right. Brussels, Paris, right. Brussels, et cetera. And I think the other thing is it, it ends up imposing a kind of neo-colonialism, right, where big governments in in the West, United States, and Europe are making decisions that affect African people, you know, thousands of miles away. Take us to Haiti. I mean, there's a basket case if there ever was one. You've done a lot of work there. What do you see? Well, I mean, Haiti's interesting, right, because it's so close to the United States, it's almost like an experiment. I mean, I flew to Haiti, Bill, and on the plane, I've never seen anything like it. Almost every person on the plane was an American. Mm. There were hardly any Haitians in the plane, hardly any Haitians in the airport on the way back, too. And it was really astounding. So Haiti, because it's so close to the United States, becomes this like almost experiment for our charity, whether it's private Christian charity, Mm non-governmental organizations, or big foreign aid. So we've already talked about the way that foreign aid has actually undermined and destroyed farmers Mm -hmm. in Haiti. But let me give you an example. I was there and I met with these two guys, um, Alex George and Jean Ronel Noel, and they started a solar panel company. Really? And sometimes when I talk, I'll tell stories about solar panels. I'll say, how many people knew you, you could, that Haitians could make solar panels? And yeah. nobody raised <laughs> Yeah, <their> really? <laughs> right? Because we think of Haitians right. as, you know, poor people with the bowl asking for rice. So we have this stereotyped vision of poor people as objects of our charity instead of protagonists mm-hmm. in their own mm-hmm. development. So Alex and Jean Renel started this uh, solar panel company, and they make lights, etc. Mm-hmm. Well, before the earthquake, they were selling about fifty street lights a month. Oh, these are self-powered street lights. Self-powered yeah, street lights. Yeah, right? helps. Sometimes cut actually crime. have phone chargers. Yep. Yeah, and so like people want to charge their phone, and mm-hmm. sometimes they'll have outlets and mm-hmm. the phone charger. They have these great security devices, mm-hmm. so they can't be stolen. Mm-hmm. They're all self-powered street lights. They're getting importing lights from LED lights from mm-hmm. California, et cetera. So before the earthquake, they were selling 50 street lights a month. After the earthquake, the demand would just skyrocket. Yeah. And they sold about five street lights in six months huh? because a big NGO in the United States got together with lighting companies and they gave uh, uh, solar panels for away. Free, away. So what happened is in our desire to help, we destroyed local business. Now, here's the thing, Bill, that I think people need to also pay attention to. And like, it, it's, it's striking to me when I went there. 
when I tell this story, you imagine these two kind of upper middle class entrepreneurs, and that's true. The thing is, in the factory, they were hiring guys from some of the poorest areas. Sure. You know, in, in Port-au-Prince. Right, right. Places like Cité Soleil. So they're, they're hiring guys from Cité Soleil who, in fact, when they were starting the business, some of the guys were, were going to come work for them. They said, look, you know, what are we going to do? We need a job. And they were getting offers to join gangs. And they said, you know, they give you $500 and yeah. a gun. Wow, that's a competition. Immediately making money. Yeah. And so he said, what do we do? And John Ronell, he's like, I'm saying, don't go there. Don't go there. It's, it's, it's going to be to just hold on. Come mm. work with us. So City Soleil was ranked by the United Nations, I think it was 2006, as the most dangerous place on the planet. Wow. These guys are hiring men from City Soleil to work in the factories, men who have families. Who would rather be honest. Oh, absolutely. They want to live a long life and take care of their families. Would you rather be in a gang where you're most likely going to die soon? Right. The problem is when we give away free stuff, we're not just hurting the upper middle class entrepreneurs. We're disemploying fathers who have a wife and children uh, from some of the poorest places on the planet. So our help actually often hurts the very people we're trying to help. So, Michael, you've been at this for a long time. You've probably written 100 white papers, but you decided to make a movie. Why? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. First of all, one of the things we wanted to show in the film is to actually allow people to hear the voices and see the stories of people in the developing world. And what's this film called? It's called Poverty, Inc. Mm -hmm. It's about how, despite good intentions, despite benevolence, a poverty industry has arisen. And unfortunately, if poor people get out of poverty, the poverty industry goes away. And so there's these mixed incentives. Mm. But the reason we did a film is we wanted to tell stories. We wanted to have people in the developing world be able to express their story and hear their voice. So if I write a white paper, or you write a white paper, it's just, you know, fine. That's not very interesting. But actually to hear people in, say, West Africa and Ghana, to hear Herman Chenner Hesse, who's one of the uh, people I interviewed, tell the story of how he got together with five other companies to bid for a project. Mm -hmm. And everything was going well. But their competitor was a European company who got their government to make a soft loan to the uh, country of Ghana. There you go. On the condition, of course, that the European company right. got the deal. And so the Ghanaian government said, look, we love you guys, but nothing beats free money. Yeah. Now, if I wrote a white paper, you'd say, well, you know, there's many different ways we could think about these things. But if you hear him telling the story, you realize that our actions actually hurt real people. Last time I looked, uh, Poverty, Inc. was still a work in progress. You were sort of getting ready to, to work the film festival trail. What's the status? Well, we are in the final stages of, of, of finishing it. Uh, we've shown at a couple film festivals as a work in progress. Uh, we've already won three best documentaries, which mm -hmm. was really encouraging. And what was also interesting is we played at very different political places on kind of the libertarians and the kind of more of a progressive left. And we've won best documentary in both those places. So really? that was really encouraging to us. Yeah, it was great. And, um, we're really happy about that because our goal wasn't to make a, a political film, but to really change the discussion and really create discussion. We are playing in Philadelphia at a film festival, and then our big launch goes at the Austin Film Festival and the Savannah Film Festival at the end of October. Mm -hmm. So if any of your listeners are in Austin or Savannah, come by. And then we're also playing at the Leeds Film Festival uh, in the UK and uh, the Denver, Stars Denver Film Festival, middle of November, and also in the Bahamas. So uh, you can find out all about our festivals and our festival schedule at povertyinc.org. And when do you hit general theatrical release? I assume you're going to hit the art film cinemas? Well, we're going to be doing some, some at least some regional re releases in you know, New York and, and Los Angeles, we hope, and then maybe a type of kind of a pre-theatrical release in maybe in 100 cities. And then we'll see what happens. And if, if the reception, which has been really good so far, continues, you know, look at the possibility of theatrical release and then ultimately go on to uh, video on demand, you know, iTunes and things like that. So, Michael, you've, you've been a professor, you've done field work, you've written white papers, you're making this film. What do you hope to accomplish with all this? Well, our real hope is to really reframe the whole discussion of the debate. We want people to think, right? I mean, one of the things that comes up in the film is it's important to have a heart for the poor. We have to help the poor, but we also need a mind for the poor. And it's not enough just to go do something. One of the things we're trying to do is get people to rethink all the assumptions a lot of the things we do now, like every time we think we think we're being innovative, but we're actually just making a harmful system more effectively mm, harmful. Mm. And so we want people to actually not just try to innovate within the given framework, 
We want people to stop and to think and not just try to be the next hero, but actually say, how can I partner with people in poverty and ask the better question, not what can I do, but how do people in poverty create prosperity for their families and communities? Well, Michael, you're doing God's work. I wish you the best, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Bill. That was Michael Matheson Miller, research fellow from the Acton Institute and the producer and director of Poverty, Inc. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. To send us comments and feedback on this or any of our past shows, visit realclearradio.org and click on the email bill link. Real Clear Radio Hour is a partnership with Real Clear Politics, one of America's top political websites. I check Real Clear every day for the latest news articles, election polls, and political commentary. Ahead, Maget Wade, founder and CEO of a startup company manufacturing luxury skincare products based on indigenous Senegalese recipes, explains why the laws of Senegal condemn her countrymen to poverty despite the well-meaning efforts of foreign aid organizations. Stay tuned.